Certain plants evoke the idea of particular areas like grasslands, meadows, hedgerows or gardens because we just get used to seeing them in these particular locations. Other plants are full of the mystery of the forest, splashing colour across the woodland floor. Bluebells, as an example, are famous for turning ordinary woods into a stunning scene in late March until early May. So this time we're going to be having a look at the folklore of woodland plants. And my choice of plants was inspired by a post by the Woodland Trust in their guide to woodland wildflowers. Yes, some of them do grow in other places, but they are basically associated with woodlands on the British Isles. So let's learn more about cowslips, forget-me-nots, lily of the valley, primroses and red campion in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I do hope that you're well. We're leaving behind the folklore of Moorland that we were doing in January, and we're moving into the forest this month. So there's going to be folklore of flowers and some more trees. Fungi is finally going to make an appearance, and we'll also be looking at some forest protectors as well. This particular episode, because it's plants and there's already different Victorian language of flowers meanings associated with them, I'm not actually having a flower like sponsoring this week's episode because that would probably be a bit like overkill. I've not forgotten this week, it's just there's so many of them in here anyway. If you are watching on YouTube, then I will be putting a photo of each of the plants up so that you know what I'm talking about in case you're not familiar with it. If you're listening on a different platform, then you can see all the images in the blog post, which is linked in the show notes. So let's kick things off with the cowslip or Primula veris from the Primulaceae family. Now they flower between April and May and people often pick them on May Day for garlands and they were apparently particularly popular in wedding bouquets. Now as you might imagine from the name it turns out they were originally called cowslop through their association with cowpats in fields but obviously cowslip sounds so much nicer and this is what happens you just change a single vowel and the whole name changes. Another nickname was St Peter's Keys because people thought that the heads with the flowers only on one side looked like a bunch of keys. In some legends, St Peter actually dropped the key of earth and cowslips grew on the spot where it fell. Now this link with keys apparently gave them the folk magic power to split any rocks that contained treasure, which would obviously be quite helpful. And they could also apparently exercise the devil, but the folklore doesn't actually explain how. So I've just got mental images of someone with like a bunch of cowslips in their hand, just sort of waving them at the devil until he gets born and wanders off. I'm not sure how that would work, but there we go. Cowslips are also associated with seeing fairies in Somerset folklore, specifically actually going looking for fairies. And it does seem that people would seek them at night with either the full moon or specific times of the year, like May Eve being popular. You would carry the cowslips with you, and if you'd done everything right, you would then see fairies. And Christina Oakley Harrington recommends wearing green clothes, the colour of the good folk, and taking an offering of milk or cream with you. Although, obviously, if you listen to my chat with Morgan Daimler, you would know that going looking for the fairies probably isn't one of your wisest courses of action. People did also carry cowslips if they were looking for treasure, and basically you followed the same instructions as those used for seeking fairies, except you needed to attune yourself to the idea of seeking treasure rather than fairy homes, and Harrington recommends carrying some kind of treasure with you on the principle of like attracts like, and that's the kind of basis of a lot of sympathetic magic. If you're looking for a particular thing and you have that thing with you, you're more likely to find it. Now, cowslips also appear within a love divination, because let's be honest, this wouldn't be an episode of Fabulous Folklore without one. And in this one, girls formed a ball of cowslips called a tisty tosty. And to do this, you would pick the flower heads off a cowslip and you would hang between 50 and 60 of them on a string. And then you would push the flower heads together. And then if you pull the string tight enough, it creates a ball. And then a group of young girls would toss this between themselves. While they were doing so, they also had to speak a list of names of potential partners, and whichever name they spoke at the moment someone dropped the ball was considered the one for them. But I must admit, I quite like the idea of that, that at least like everybody gets to have one, not just the person who drops the ball, but there we go. According to Mrs Burke's Language of Flowers Dictionary, cowslips meant both pensiveness and winning grace, so that could be a little bit of a mixed metaphor if you were going to send cowslips to somebody. 
And in the past, people also used cowslip to treat coughs and sleeping problems. So we're going to move on to the forget-me-not, or Myosotis sylvatica in the Baraginaceae family, and they're also known as Mousia and scorpion grass. The Myosotis comes from Mousia in Greek, which recalls the shape of the leaves, and their curled flower head was believed to resemble a scorpion's tail, hence scorpion grass. And at one point, people actually thought that the plant could cure scorpion stings. Much like cowslips, Somerset folklore says that you should carry forget-me-nots if you're looking for fairies or treasure. Now, the downside is you need to carry the right number of flowers at the right time, although it's pretty unclear what either of those values actually are. Now, it is quite interesting because there is a legend in which a traveller in the mountains sees a strange flower that he's never seen before. And as apparently people would do, he picks it. And what's really a shocking for him is the fact that as he does so, a huge entrance opens in the side of the mountain in front of him. Being the inquisitive sort, he goes inside and then he finds a huge treasure trove of gold and precious stones. Now, the traveller, he, he kind of does what most humans would do at this point, and he decides he's going to gather as much of the treasure as he can. But in the process, he drops the flower. Now, the flower does whisper a warning to forget me not, but he doesn't hear it. And he also doesn't realise that the entrance is beginning to close. Finally, it dawns on him that he's, he's going to be stuck in there. So he manages to squeeze back outside, but he's left the forget me not inside and can't reopen the treasure cave without it. So obviously, it's that idea of kind of, if he hadn't been quite so greedy and it held on to the flower, he would still have been able to wander around and have a look. Now, according to Mrs. Burke's Language of Flowers Dictionary, forget-me-nots meant true love. And that possibly comes from a different story about where the plant got its name. And I think this is the more familiar one. So in one legend, a couple walking along the Danube saw blue flowers on an island in the river. The man ignored his sweetheart's comments about the strength of the current and decided he was going to gather the flowers for her. So he managed to swim across to the island all right and he picked a bouquet of them for her. On the way back, he got caught in the current and the water dragged him under. He apparently had time to throw the bouquet onto the bank, beseeching her to forget me not before he died. In the legend, the woman was so upset about what happened that she wore forget me not in her hair until she died. There's also another version where like a knight swims to another shore and he's kind of dragged under by the weight of his armour and all that kind of thing. The general idea is basically somebody dies in the process of trying to get these flowers for their partner and they end up telling them like not to forget them and that's where the name comes from. And by the 1850s, people in Germany adopted a trend for planting forget-me-nots on their loved ones' graves. Now, the plant also had other more pragmatic uses. So in Somerset, people wore it to ward off witches during May. Others claimed that you could actually temper steel with forget-me-not juice and then steel made in such a fashion could cut stone. And also, if you set off on a journey on the 29th of February, you should also wear forget-me-not as a buttonhole. The folklore doesn't say why, but I think it's just because the 29th of February is quite a rare date, seeing as how we only see it once every four years. So we're going to move on to the Lily of the Valley or the Convalaria magellis, and this is part of the Asparagaceae family, making a cousin of asparagus. It grows well in the shade, so it can obviously be found in woodland areas. And they also indicate ancient woodlands, so if you do spot them, it's a good way to tell that you're in an established habitat. It's considered the flower of May based on when it blooms. Please note that it is also extremely toxic, because let's be honest, I had to get a poisonous one in here somehow, and any part of the plant causes sickness if eaten. Some people actually also get skin irritation after touching it as well, so best to just admire it from afar. But according to legend, the flower sprang up from Eve's tears as she left the Garden of Eden, although an alternative legend say that the flower sprang up from Mary's tears at the crucifixion. So you find this with quite a lot of plants that they've got some kind of biblical connection as to where they come from. But I must admit where the Lily of the Valley is concerned, it's actually got a much more badass origin story. And in this legend, St. Leonard fought and killed a dragon in Sussex and wild lilies of the valley sprang up from the dragon's blood, which I think is quite cool. The plant was apparently used as a decoration for spring weddings or during Whitsuntide festivals. And I'm sure you've all heard that old idea of something old, something new, something borrowed and something blue for weddings and so on. Well, in one strange custom, there was actually a fifth item and that was supposed to be Lily of the Valley. And the fact that the flowers are supposed to bring luck and love probably explains why they appear in wedding bouquets. Now, I'm not going to comment on what using poisonous flowers to attract love says about love itself. And I do find that quite an odd one that they would have become so associated with weddings. And I can't help thinking it's actually probably the scent because they're quite popular in perfume. Now, other folklore does acknowledge its poisonous side. 
because one belief claimed that whoever planted Lily of the Valley would die within a year. And as late as 1979, even the image of the flower could bring bad luck, with a handkerchief embroidered with the plant rejected as a gift in Buckinghamshire, according to Margaret Baker. Bringing it into the house was incredibly dangerous. Now, to be fair, that could also be one of your good old-fashioned cautionary tales, because the berries in particular are usually the bit that gets eaten, particularly by children, and they're like the super, super toxic parts, or it could just simply be the idea of saying it's bad luck to bring a flower in the house that small children might then start eating that kind of makes sense. But according to Mrs Burke's Language of Flowers Dictionary, the lily of the valley meant return of happiness. Now we're going to move on to a non-toxic plant, which is the primrose, which is the primula vulgaris from the primulaceae family. And they bloom in woodland clearings and they're an early nectar source for butterflies. And much like lily of the valley, they also indicate ancient woodlands. So again, if you spot them, it's a good sign that you're in an established habitat. Primroses are the flower of February alongside the violet and obviously there is an episode on violets. That said, primroses can actually flower between December and May, so plenty of time to spot them. You should never give bunches of primroses as gifts and bunches of fewer than 13 were unwelcome in the house and if you picked a lower number for your posy, that's how many chickens would hatch and apparently in Norfolk, neighbours might give a child a single primrose to then take and then they would take it into the house and then only one of the family's eggs might hatch which is a bit of a spiteful move but there we go. Primroses are usually pale yellow White ones symbolised young love, lilac ones meant confidence and red ones meant unappreciated merit. Now according to folklore, you could actually affect the colour by the planting conditions. I do think this is probably nonsense and you'll see why I say that in a minute. Because feeding a primrose plant with bull's blood would apparently guarantee red flowers and then planting them upside down on Good Friday would then give a pink, red or red with a yellow centre flower. There was also another piece of folklore that said that if you planted a primrose upside down, you would get a cowslip. And if you put in a cow, if you planted a cowslip upside down, you'd get a primrose. So make of that what you will. Now, in German folklore, primroses could open doors to fairy caves containing gold. So they're a little bit like the whole treasure hunting and fairy spotting idea that we got with cowslips and forget me nots. Some legends claim that Bertha lured children from their homes using primroses and into her halls. Now this does actually link to the idea of the primrose as a key, since one of the German names for the flowers is apparently Schlüsselblume. So that would kind of make sense again with the whole idea of keys that we'll see with cowslips. And again, like cowslips, you could carry primroses to see fairies or find treasure. That said, Harrington does note that that primroses seem to be more useful when you're finding fairies associated with mountains or caves, which is bizarre considering how strongly associated primroses are with woodland, but again, who said folklore ever had to actually make sense. There was also a belief that children who ate primroses could see fairies as well. So in Somerset, some people would hang a ball of primroses over the door on Midsummer's Eve for protection. Elsewhere, people did so on May Eve. In Ireland, people tied primrose balls to their cows' tails to ward off supernatural creatures. And in Yorkshire, people made wreaths of primroses, green leaves and buttercups and hung them up on May Eve to bring luck and protection over the coming season. Now, it was really important not to take the wreath down and to just let it wither away naturally to make sure that you didn't accidentally reverse any of the good luck or whatever. According to Mrs Burke's Language of Flowers Dictionary, primroses meant early youth. They do appear in folk medicine, so drinking an infusion of fresh primrose flowers during May was believed to calm nervous disorders, and meanwhile people also used the leaves to heal wounds. And in the 1600s, people would make something called primrose pottage, and this was basically boiling primrose flowers, almond milk, saffron, honey, ginger and rice flour to make a dessert. I was a bit confused about whether they'd actually have almond milk in the 1600s, but that was what the book said. Woodcutters in Hampshire and the New Forest boiled primroses in lard to make an ointment for any injuries as well. So you can kind of see where you then start getting a lot of these ideas about healing wounds and so on with primroses, which is quite cool. And then our final plant is the red campion, Selena dioca, in the Carrier Felaceae family. And this prefers shady woodland areas. And again, like some of these other plants, they are an ancient woodland indicator. I found that really funny when I read that, purely because of the fact that there is some red campion growing sort of near me. And like, I'm in a 1970s housing estate. So I was like, I don't really think this is what they mean by an ancient woodland. But I also don't know how long that particular patch of woodland has been there, if it predates 
the estate or not, which it possibly does. So that would be quite cool. But anyway, the Selena in its name possibly comes from Cylon, a Greek word meaning saliva, and this in turn references the plant's gooey secretions on its stems. Isn't gooey a really fun word to say? According to legend, red campion flowers guard the honey stores of bees, and they also prevent fairies from being discovered. So you would kind of have to hope that like, if you went out with your primroses or cow's lips to see fairies, that they weren't just hiding behind red campion. The plant is linked with St James since it flowers near his feast day of the 25th of July. Now in Cumberland, the flower is associated with Robin Goodfellow or Puck. Considered a native British spirit, his surname recalls the way people refer to fairies as the good folk. One of the reasons for doing this is you're sort of trying to appeal to their better nature. So if you refer to them as the good folk or the fair folk or the good neighbours, you're trying to remind them of the good side of their nature. Now, Robin can be portrayed as a household spirit where he helps people with their chores. And if anyone forgot to pay him white bread and milk for his help, then he would just steal what he was owed instead. Now, children believed it would actually cause their mother's death to pick Red Campion. And in the 1960s and 1970s, the plant was still called Mother and Father Die in Cumbria and children just didn't pick them. Now, I did find that somewhat surprising because Red Campion isn't poisonous to humans. So there's not really any reason to have like a prohibition against it like that. But people did somehow link the plant to snakes, with one belief claiming that bringing red campion into the house would invite snakes with it. So that might explain the idea that your parents would die if you brought it home. I mean, there's other plants that you should probably leave outside more, but I guess that might be where that came from. So what do we actually make of these woodland plants? I think one of the things that was really interesting about these particular plants is the way that obviously some of them are indicators of ancient woodland. So even if you ignore the folklore about them, they are actually really important to the ecosystem. Many of them are very popular with pollinators. And I think the idea that they're associated with these really old habitats just shows how long humans have actually lived alongside them. The fact that you can use some of them to look for fairies is a really interesting one because nothing good ever really comes of going looking for them. But I think the idea of using them to look for treasure probably makes a little bit more sense, particularly with the idea of the forget-me-not being associated with this entire cavern full of a treasure trove and so on. So that was really interesting. But I think ultimately these particular bits of folklore, while they sometimes might sound a bit nonsensical, we're probably missing what a lot of that actually represented at the time. So we have the story, but we maybe don't have the context or we don't have the awareness of what that story actually meant to people to know how people were actually interpreting these different stories about these different plants. Obviously, some of them have really interesting origin stories and a lot of them do end up getting linked to things related to the Bible, which obviously indicates the extent that Christianity had an effect on how people interpreted things. But I do think that we we, we need to bear in mind that while folklore might sound odd or I've said a couple of times in the episode, oh, that doesn't make sense. Again, it's because we, we've got this fragment of information and we don't know how it fits into a wider whole or anything like that. And it's also the fact that if someone's gone around collecting folklore, you don't know the extent to which somebody's actually interpreted that themselves, how much have they edited it, how much have they left stuff out and have they actually managed to get the correct information out of the person or have they just got like the half remembered bit that someone can't quite remember all the details, which is just what happens when you ask people questions. But I do think it is really important to celebrate these woodland plants, just as it's really important to celebrate woodlands as a whole. And I think it's such a shame in modern Britain, the fact that woodlands in areas like that can just be destroyed without a second thought, just because some developers decided that they fancy the land, because we are such a nature depleted area. And it has been proven time and again that people just need to be around trees and need to be in natural areas. So I think even just having a little pocket of a natural area or a little pocket of a woodland on just a housing estate is really going to ultimately benefit everyone. But anyway, I do hope that you would consider checking out the Woodland Trust because they are doing excellent work in actually helping to preserve woodland across the country. And they do also then do various things with like conservation and management, but they also try out things like rewilding and stuff as well. So it might be interesting to have a look at them and what they're doing. But anyway, we're going to have a look at trees next week. Now, obviously, I've done trees multiple times on the podcast. I think everyone knows how much I love trees, but I'm going to look at some of the ones where there's not a huge amount of folklore about them. So there won't be just one tree. There'll be several of the ones with a little bit less about them. So I hope you enjoy that next week. So in the meantime, thank you as ever for the coffees. Thank you for the reviews. And I'll see you next week. Cheerio. 
Well, thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.